silicon-oxygen-silicon bonds. Sheets form, as in the structure of mica. The sheets can then stack one on top of another. Now, each of the tetrahedra share all oxygen atoms with other tetrahedra, forming a three-dimensional framework like quartz. The length of the bonds between the silicon and the oxygen atoms are all the same. On this atomic scale, it's a symmetrical structure of indefinite length. Silicates are hard to melt. The covalent silicon-oxygen bonds are strong. To extract elemental silicon out of quartz, one has to mix it with carbon and heat it to a high temperature. But the silicon obtained that way still isn't pure enough for application in today's technology of chips and solar cells. AT&T Bell Labs in Short Hills, New Jersey. It was here a scientist named William Fan advanced the technique of purifying silicon called zone refining. Well, they had a remarkable collection of brilliant people here when I first showed up on the scene in 45. Dr. Field Winslow is an organic chemist. Yeah, we have to seal off the tube with a monomer in the next couple hours before it explodes. Although not directly involved in the semiconductor project, he remembers the day William Fan came into his office. He came up to visit me one day and said he had this new idea that what I want to do is to purify silicon and germanium by placing these materials in a boat and sweeping a hot zone repeatedly over this boat so that you melt uh, the material in the boat in zones and sweep these zones along the length of the boat and repeat it and in the hopes of uh, driving the impurities ahead of this hot zone. The principle William Fan employed was when a liquid solidifies the crystal doesn't easily incorporate foreign materials. As a result the impurities concentrate in a liquid zone. And the object is that when this silicon resolidifies, the impurities in this molten zone are pushed ahead of the solidifying material. And each time, more and more of the impurities are swept toward one end of the boat. Bell scientists knew the electrical properties of silicon depended on its purity. They knew if they could obtain pure silicon and then dope it, that is, add trace amounts of other elements to it, they could precisely control its conductivity. As a result of Fan's work in purifying silicon, it became possible to design and build transistors which replaced the vacuum tube. That was nearly 40 years ago. Techniques have changed. Now they pull silicon crystals, slice them up, and then dope them with small amounts of the trace elements. In this way, changes in technology and demand can in turn change our needs for different elements and their minerals. To review, we live on a dynamic planet, and the differentiation of materials in the planet is still occurring. The elements and minerals found at the Earth's core are different than those found at the surface. And different chemical compounds and minerals are still being formed and deposited in widely scattered places. The three processes at work are magmatic action, where minerals are crystallized out in underground chambers of molten rock. Hydrothermal action, where, from superheated water, chemical compounds are deposited. And sedimentary action, where through physical rather than chemical processes, rivers and streams transport minerals and deposit them in new areas. One of the common sedimentary rocks is limestone, calcium carbonate. It's been used throughout civilization as building material, but acidic rain reacts with the calcium carbonate, turning ancient works of art into calcium salts. The same reaction is responsible for caves. Another common substance, sand, has only recently been put to a more exotic use than building by first obtaining silicon from the silicon dioxide and then purifying it, the information revolution was made possible. This quarry is a symbol of our dependence on the earth. We take from it its riches, some given to us simply like sand, some that have to be torn from its innards like the rocks. 
or iron ore, some that are released by our ingenuity, like silicon. We're very successful at what we do, and so I don't doubt for a minute that under your feet there is another technological revolution waiting to be released by your hands, by your mind. But there is more, and this quarry also symbolizes that. The earth, the oceans, the atmosphere, we ourselves have been part of a grand enterprise, a living planet. It's not been a static one, it's changed. Remember those marvelous cycles of carbon dioxide of water that we talked about in an earlier program? They've evolved with time. But then we come on the scenes, masters at transforming a technology, and we have modified these cycles, not just one of them, but many of them, and we intrude on them with a chemical shock, with a perturbation that is introduced in the geological equivalent of a blink of an eyelid, a mere 100 years or so. The perturbations that our civilization, our culture, have introduced to the Earth may exceed the repair mechanisms that this marvelous organism, chemical system, has evolved for itself. This excellent canopy, our home in matter and in spirit, it deserves our best.